Good day everyone and welcome to our science class. Today we shall be looking at the body system. By the end of this unit, we should be able to name the parts of the various body systems, describe the processes of the various body systems, explain the interrelationships between the systems. Let us recap, in grade 7 we looked at the sense organs. The human eye, I hope this picture looks familiar. Um, normally you are required to be able to name the different parts and uh, state their functions. So looking at the human eye, um, we said it is having three layers that cover the entire eye. Uh, you can see the retina there, that is the innermost layer. Next to it, if you're going outside, you have the choroid, and finally you have the sclera. That's the white part that covers the entire eye. If you're looking into somebody's eye, that is the part you will normally see. Um, if you come to the front of the eye, the sclera, the white of the eye, is transparent, meaning you can see through it. And uh, there it forms the cornea. It's, not, it's also labeled there, yes, the cornea. And uh, if you take the choroid, that is the middle layer which is colored red there, at the front it forms the ciliary muscles or ciliary body. Um, it is a little bit uh, not labeled there properly. The arrow is not pointing to the ciliary muscles actually. It's pointing to the suspensory ligaments that hold the lens. You can see the lens that is labeled the crystalline lens. Um, again, the choroid forms what we call the iris. When you look into somebody's eye, the dark or brown or whatever color you see in the middle, that is the iris. Now, the iris has a space, a hole in the center that we refer to as the pupil. This is where light passes. And then, of course, uh, the eyeball, the shape is maintained by two types of liquids. At the front, you have the aqueous humor, which is more, of, uh, more or less liquid. And then uh, you come, and the, the bigger ball is uh, made up of a gel that we refer to as the vitreous humor. And uh, of course, when uh, light comes into the eye, it's the retina that will uh, capture the, the light and convert it into, lights, uh, uh, convert it into signals which the brain can understand. So these signals are passed through the optic nerve. So make sure you have a good look at the, your di diagrams of the eye and uh, revise those notes. Like I said, you must know how to label all the parts and state the functions. In addition, you will be required to look at uh, um, defects of the eye. Uh, the most common ones are short sight, wherein somebody can see things at shorter distance clearly but when they are at a far distance, they can't see properly. And the other one is long sight, which means the person can see things at distant or long distance clearly, but when things are nearer, like when they want to read or look at something closer, the picture is not clear. So also you will be required to know what correction can be used to uh, correct the situation. For short sight, they use... Um, concave lens. Next, we want to look at the human ear. Um, we divide the ear into three areas. Um, the outer ear, that starts from the auricle or the outer ear, and all the way down to the tympanic uh, membrane, or commonly is this called, can you guess? Did you say oval window? That is wrong. It is the eardrum. So from the outer ear to the eardrum, that, is the, that forms the uh, outer ear. Now, from the eardrum to where the um, oval window start, um, stops, that is the middle ear. And from that up to the nerves, that is the inner ear. So let's go back. The outer ear, simply you have the auricle or these uh, lobes, and then you have the auditory canal, the tube that uh, directs the sound into the ear. And like I said, it stops at the ear drum. So in the middle ear, we have the three small bones. Uh, we call them the ossicles. 
Uh, they include the Malos, the Incos, or the Stapes. That, those are the scientific names. Um, other names which are also acceptable is simply the Hammer, the Anvil, and the Stirrup. So you try to find a way you can remember those names, and again, be careful with the spellings. Now, these are connected to the oval window. You also have the round window. These two work together to help maintain pressure in the air. Uh, you can see the tube there that is going down. It's called the Eustachian tube. That is the one that helps to adjust sound, I mean, uh, air pressure. And if the air pressure is not correct, sound vibration will not be processed properly. Uh, if you've traveled in an aeroplane or you've moved from a lower, um, may say, ground floor and you go into a very high building, you go to the top floor, you might have experienced some, you know, little pop in your ear. Uh, that is because of changes that are made to adjust the pressure in your, uh, the eustachian tube. That is to correct the pressure in the middle ear. Now, finally, in the inner ear, we have two organs there. There is the cochlea, which is concerned with sound, and uh, it's the main organ that helps us to process sound. Uh, you can see it is connected to the cochlear nerve. And uh, at the top, you have the semicircular canals. Uh, These ones deal with balance to help us so that uh, we're able to maintain our balance. We don't fall like when you're walking, you sit down, you're lying down. They help you maintain your posture. If something is wrong with your semicircular canals, um, you might easily be unsteady. You may have seen, for example, when people uh, get drunk with alcohol or something else, um, the semicircular canals are not functioning properly, and you can see such people, they don't, or they find it difficult to maintain their posture. All right, and then, of course, you can see the nerve that is coming from the semicircular canal. Of course, at this level, uh, we simply mention the auditory nerve. But actually, you can see it's two nerves there. A nerve from the semicircular canal called the vestibular nerve. And there you have the nerve from the cochlea. These two together form the auditory nerve that goes to the brain. Okay, so that's the ear. Again, remember to uh, revise your studies on uh, naming the parts and stating the functions of each of the parts. There, let us con concentrate on the nasal cavity because uh, that is where you have the soft tissues that are lined with um, epithelial cells that have nerve endings. So when chemicals in the air, substances in the air, uh, when they reach your nose, they dissolve in the moist lining of the nose. Now, the nerve endings pick up sensations about these chemicals and that is sent to the brain. And so your brain tells you what this chemical is from. Of course, it is something that is land. Um, you've probably got a nice bowl of uh, benachin and you know the, the flavor of the benachin. So even if you don't look at it, next time the smell comes, from memory your brain is able to tell you this is coming from benachin. And the same thing with, for example, if a, a, a classmate should uh, release foul odor, from memory, your brain is able to tell you there's bad air here, so you do something to either fan off the bad odor or you move away. Um, it is also important to note that the nasal cavity, the nerves there, um, and the nerves from the tongue, which deal with taste, they are somehow interlinked. And uh, hence, you might have observed, if you have problem um, smelling certain food, your taste also are not very good at that point in time. Like when you have common cold and your nose is all filled up with you know, uh, mucus, your taste and your smell are very poor at that stage. So with the human, um, I mean with the nose or the nostril rather, um, what we need to concentrate on is that they help us uh, detect sensation for um, smell. Next is the human tongue. Um, the tongue is um, having little, you know, bumps. If you look at it closely, you see lots of little bumps. And if this is viewed in the microscope, um, you have what we call the taste buds. Now, these are so designed, if you look at the top right corner, uh, you can see how 
you know, you have some uh, tissues and then they are linked up with the nerves. These are the nerves that will take the sensation up to your brain. So when substances land on your tongue, um, they dissolve in the moisture that is on your tongue. That is the saliva that is there. And then these nerves will pick up the sensation and is taken to the um, brain. So like I mentioned, this uh, nerve is also connected to the nerves that come from the nostril or from the nose. So like I mentioned earlier, if there is a problem with um, your nostril, like common cold, uh, your sound and the, I mean your taste and your smell might be affected. Now the tongue, these taste buds are on every part of the tongue and they can taste every type of taste. Uh, we concentrate on four main tastes, sweet, salty, sour, and bitter. Now, you can see we've given different colors on the tongue there. And uh, this is to help us understand that the tip of the tongue is far more sensitive to sweet things, you know, sweet and uh, sugary things. And then towards the side, they are sensitive to salty things. If you go to the back, side, a little bit to the back, but not exactly, somewhere in the center, those ones are sensitive to sour things. And at the very back, you have more uh, buds that are very sensitive to bitter. But don't forget, every part of the tongue can taste any type of taste. Um, finally, we want to look at the human skin. Now, Again, remember, you should learn to draw, the, I mean, name the parts. At this level, usually they will bring the diagram for you. So your part is to make sure you understand the parts. You should be able to name the parts and state their function. So first of all, we describe the human skin as being made up of three parts. The epidermis, the dermis, and the fat layer, often called subcutaneous tissue. So let's go to the dermis, I mean the epidermis. There you have um, the dead cells. That's the part you see when you look at uh, your skin. And uh, just below it, you have the um, melanocyte, or the area containing melanin. That is what gives the skin its color. And uh, if you go a little bit down, then we meet the dermis. And uh, there you have the nerve endings. You have the sweat gland that process sweat. You know, when the blood comes, to that area, waste are removed, extra, extra water is also removed, and this is sent through the sweat duct out of your skin. And if you also look a little bit towards the center, you have the hair follicle, it's like a tube. Inside this tube, you have the hair growing out of it. And at the left side of the, uh, the, the follicle, you can see the sebaceous gland. It is also known as the oil gland that release oil that makes the hair very soft. Uh, if the oil is lacking, your hair becomes dry and it can easily break. Uh, you also have the hair erector muscle on the right of the follicle. Now this is the muscle that helps the hair to stand or to relax. Um, in uh, hot conditions, you need the hair to um, relax so that uh, whatever heat your body is producing can easily escape. But uh, in cool conditions, the hair will stand erect. So that way, air is trapped and uh, that will help to insulate, to keep your body warm. And down, we have this fat layer. It's made up of a lot of fat cells that helps to make your skin, you know, provide something like a cushion so that, uh, you know, when you bump into things, you, it reduces the pain you feel. And of course, the fat also helps to insulate the body, keep the body warm so you don't lose heat because heat is very expensive for the body to make. Um, that's where you begin to find a lot of the nerve endings. So you will notice that uh, it's not everything you feel, but of course um, there are some things like you know, pressure or pain or heat that you can feel. There are lots of nerves which are not shown there that uh, help you to detect those sensations. So those are very important. And um, so you need to Again, label the parts and state the functions of the skin. Um, let's go to grade 8. In grade 8, we looked at some organs of the human body. Again, let us recap. Uh, there are some essential terms there. Anatomy, which deals with the structure of the body. 
Physiology deals with the functions of the body. Uh, cellular organization describes the way the body is made up of cells that are grouped or organized into tissue, the tissue into organ, the organ into organ system, and the organ system to the organism. Uh, we missed an arrow there, so it should be cell, tissue, organ, organ system. There should be an arrow between organ system and organism. So, here is a typical example you have, if you take it from the right, you have the human as an organism made up of many, many systems. There is the uh, nervous system, you can see the brain there. There is the circulatory system, the heart, and then there is the respiratory system, the lungs there, and then the digestive system, which I want you to look at. So go to the left, you can see the digestive system, and uh, you have many organ systems there. Uh, the digestive system is an organ system. You can see you have the heart, you have the stomach, you have the colon or the large intestine, you have the small intestine, the pancreas is there, it's not shown. So that's an organ system. Now this organ system, you can see it's made up of many organs. We've taken one out, the small intestine, all right? And the small intestine in turn is made up of tissues. So again, you can see an example of the tissue shown there is a group of cells that are working together. So we have epithelial cells from the intestine that form um, that uh, tissue. So the epithelial cells, of course, they line. They have, you find them in the inside of the small intestine. So that's a typical example of organization of um, organi I mean cells in the organism. You start from cell on the left, if you look from the left, you have from the cell to the tissue to the organ to organ system and finally you have the organism. Let's look at the human body and we have various organs there. Um, this picture helps you to see the different positions of the organ which is very important, you need that. You need to know for example the position of the heart the position of the lungs, uh, the position of the liver, the position of the stomach. You can see the uh, kidneys, uh, not very, I mean, not showing clearly, but you can see uh, that they are at the back. You can see the tubes coming from the kidney, going down to the bladder, all right? And we can also see the two major blood vessels, huh? the vena cava and the aorta running at the back. So. If you come to the top, you can see the trachea and then other things that are attached there. So this is a, you know, um, a, a general view of the human body system. So like I mentioned, you need to know their locations and um, you know, like sometimes somebody will be pointing to the left and say, here is my liver, which is very wrong. Uh, where is your liver? You can see your liver is on the right. It's your stomach that is on the left. Of course, we all know where our stomach is because we can feel it. If you drink, for example, a lot of water and shake your body, you can feel the water shaking. But if you ask somebody, where are the kidneys? Uh, they probably may not know that, except you have to... If you look at the picture, you can see they are at the back and at just about the point where you have your waist. So you need to know the positions of all these organs. So, one of the organs we mentioned is the heart. At grade 8 level, you're required to know this organ, its position, like I mentioned, and you should be able to label the parts. So let's take a quick look at it. Uh, as you can see, it's divided into <coughs> four areas. Okay, At the bottom, you can see the uh, left and right ventricle. And if you go to the top, you have the right and the left atrium. And connected to the heart, Let's look at it. You have the vena cava on the left. You have one big tube coming from the top that comes from the head and the neck or the upper parts of the body. And there you have another tube that is coming from the lower parts of the body. So the, all of this pour into the right atrium. Next, if you look, you can see coming from the right ventricle, you have the pulmonary artery. And you can see when it goes up, it divides into left and right, so that one goes to the right lung and one goes to the left lung. And uh, also, if you look, you can see the aorta. 
uh, that one that is forming something like an arch, okay? Now, you can see branches going up to supply the upper parts of the body, and then the main branch, it's coming down. And also, we can see the pulmonary vein. Again, you have left and the right. Now, when you're looking at the, uh, the screen, what you're looking at is, you have to look at it this way. Where my left is pointing, that is the right of the diagram. And where my right is pointing, that is the left of the diagram. And it's easier for you to understand it that way. Uh, there are valves. Valves help to control the flow of blood. They are like the traffic police. They make sure vehicles move only in one direction. If you want to come the other direction, you have to go up to a certain point, you go round and then come back. But you cannot be going where others are coming. So the valves ensure that blood flows only in one direction. To make it simple, we say they control the back flow of blood. That means they don't allow blood to flow back. It goes only forward. So uh, between the right atrium and the right ventricle, you have the tricuspid valve. And between the left atrium and the left ventricle, you have uh, the bicuspid valve, also known as the mitral valve. And then leading from the pulmonary artery and leading from the aorta, you have what we call the semilunar valve, which in turn are given individual names. Uh, that for the aorta is called the aortic nerve, and that for the uh, pulmonary artery is the pulmonary valve. So that's a brief summary of the heart as an organ. Again, remember to know the names of the parts and their functions. Next, uh, we want to see how much we re remember from our study of the heart. So let us take it from um, on the screen. We're, look we're trying to start from the right side of the diagram, uh, which, if I'm pointing, is this end. Remember I told you my left is pointing to the right. So you have there something to guide you. You see R and then space, V space at the bottom. So what do you think is the right, uh, what are the, the, what's the right name for that area? Okay, if you said the right ventricle, you are correct. Now let's go to the um, left side of the diagram, which again corresponds to my right. So you can see L and V. So yes, it's easy to guess. That will be the left ventricle. Let's go to the right of the diagram, which corresponds to my left. At the top, you have RA. So that represents the right atrium. And you can see an arrow showing you the, way, uh, the direction of the flow of blood. So that blood is coming from the vena cava. And if we go to the left of the diagram, which again corresponds to our right, uh, we're looking at the, 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 the atrium that is there is the left atrium. And the blood coming in is coming from the pulmonary vein. Let us look at the two tubes that are pointing up. You can see the arrows indicate the blood is going out of the heart. So it says D, P, space, A, space, takes blood to the space. So what should be the right answer there? It should be the pulmonary artery takes blood to the, did you say lungs? You guessed right. Uh, let's go to the other end. D, a space takes blood to the dash. Yes, it should be the aorta takes blood to the rest of the body. Okay, so uh, down there, is, there are some more questions there. <clears throat> the heart is made out of what? The options are down there. Uh, let's first of all look at the options. We have right, left, cardiac or cardiac, body, pump, lungs, oxygen. So we should use these words to fill in the blank spaces. So let's start. The heart is made out of dash muscle. So what should be the right answer? It should be cardiac muscle. If you remember your study of muscles, uh, we talked about cardiac muscles, we talked about skeletal muscles, epithelial muscles, and nervous muscles. So if you remember those types of muscles, what the heart is actually made up of cardiac muscle. It is a double 
dash that squeezes the blood around the dash and to the dash. So let's work that out. It is a double. Do you say a double right? No. Double left? No. Cardiac we've already used. Double body? No. Double pump? I think so. It is a double pump that squeezes the blood around the, around what? The body. And to the, what? Lungs. So next, the dash side pumps blood to the lungs. Let's fill that up. The dash side pumps blood to the lungs. So which side of the heart pumps blood to the lungs? That will be the right side. The right side pumps blood to the lungs to pick up what? Uh, is it carbon dioxide? But no, we don't have carbon dioxide there. What do we need is oxygen. So oxygen should be the right answer. So let's go over that. The right side pumps blood to the lungs to pick up oxygen. The final sentence, the dash side. So we used right, so now we are left with the left side. The left side pumps blood around the rest of the body. So that, those are the, the answers to um, that question. Next, the respiratory organs. Um, here we should concentrate on the nostril, coming down to the trachea. But before that, you have the pharynx. That is where the, um, the, 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 the tube from the nose and that from the mouth where they meet, that's the pharynx. And when you go down, where you have the voice box is the larynx. That is part of the trachea. And of course, you have the trachea itself. You can see something like rings around it. These are made of cartilage. They help to keep the trachea open so that air can flow. And the, the, the trachea is divided into two branches. Each we call bronchus. If it is more than one, you say bronchi. And the bronchus, in turn, is divided into smaller branches that we refer to as the bronchioles. I'm not sure it's labeled there. And the, they keep on dividing until at the tip you have the alveoli, the air sacs. Okay, so also it's very important to know that part of um, the respiratory system, you have the diaphragm and the ribs, but here we're looking at the organs. So you must be able to identify the, the lungs as an organ and uh, of course label them. So quick test again on the respiratory system. Um, let's look at the first line. That is pointing to, did you say the mouth? That would be wrong. It's the nostril. Next, you come down to the pharynx. And uh, then you have, like we said, the larynx or the voice box. And then the trachea. Next is the bronchus. The next line is pointing to the lung. Uh, since uh, we're looking at two lungs, so this will be the left lung. And uh, uh, down we can see the next line is pointing to the bronchiole. And the final one, no, next, second to last, is pointing to the alveol alveoli, if it is pointing to many. If it is one, it will be the alveolus. And at the bottom we have the diaphragm. This, these are the different parts of the respiratory system. If you got all of them right, congratulations. So the other organs we want to look at are the liver, which is on the uh, left on your screen. And you can see uh, attached to the liver is the gallbladder. The liver, in this instance, um, the main function there is to produce bile, which is very important in digestion. And uh, this bile is stored in the gallbladder. And when it is needed, you can see it flows down a tube that is called the bile duct and then it joins the intestine. Uh, on the right, you have, on the right of the screen, you, you have the, um, the stomach, and of course, just at the beginning of the end of the stomach, you have the duodenum, which is the start of the intestine. So that's what the liver looks like, in case it comes in your question, so you know you have what to label them. Um, next is to look at organs of the urinary system. Um, we can see the kidneys, there are two of them. Remember when you see diagram, what appears on the left of your screen is actually the right side and what appears on the right of your screen 
is the left side of that body. So we have the two uh, kidneys, and from the kidneys you have the ureta coming down to the bladder. Now these are the ones that form the urinary system. Don't confuse the urinary system with the excretory system because then you have three other organs that are involved in excretion. Very important. And don't forget also the blood vessels. We already mentioned them. You can see the branch that is coming from the aorta and then you can see the branch that is going towards the vena cava. So these are very important. Uh, they are positions. Sometimes they are not colored. So, but if you know, when you look at them in the diagram, you will notice that the aorta is always, from the diagram, is on the, uh, this side of the diagram, which is actually the left of the uh, body. And then you have the vena cava, which is on the left of the diagram, but it actually corresponds to the right of the body. And if we go to down, you have the bladder, and then the tube that goes out of the bladder, or rather that takes uh, urine, because the bladder is there to store urine. The tube that takes the urine out of the bladder is the urethra. I don't confuse the urethra with the ureta. You can check the spelling. Ureta, you can see the spelling, U-R-E-T-E-R. -E urethra, U-R-E-T-H-R-A. They have different functions. Ureta takes urine from the kidney to the bladder. Ureta takes urine from the bladder to the outside of the body. The kidney itself, <coughs> when you look at this in detail, you can uh, see from the picture there, uh, we have a branch coming from the aorta that forms the renal artery, and the branch that goes to the vena cava that forms the renal vein. And uh, we can see the tube that takes urine from the kidney, which we mentioned, the ureta. And if we look at the kidney itself, uh, we normally say it is made up of three uh, distinct areas. You have the outer cortex, and then you have the medulla in the center, and uh, where you have the blood vessels and the ureter connected, that is the pelvis. So this is the kidney as an organ. Um, so now let's test on the urinary system. Now remember we said the left side of the screen corresponds to the right of the body. So the first label starting from the top should be, you guessed right, that should be the right kidney. And let's go down. Now remember the two blood vessels. I told you if you remember the positions that the, uh, the first one we should label, it's uh, actually on the right side. So that will be the vena, I mean vena cava. And the next one is on the left side of the body, which corresponds to our right. That would be the aorta. And the next line is actually pointing to the ureta. Next is the bladder. And uh, remember what we said, um, what you see just where the bladder ends is the sphincter muscle. These are special muscles that help to control the flow of uh, urine so that urine doesn't just come and pass all the time. If they are working well, um, you are able to keep the urine for a very long, for a long time, which is not advised, it's wrong. Whenever you feel like you want to urinate, go and release it because you're putting these muscles to work. Uh, you will not feel it when you are younger, but when you get old, because you've been uh, working them tirelessly, they become very weak, and uh, when urine comes, you will not have much control. By the time you reach the toilet, it's already starting to drip. Uh, the last one there is the urethra. That is the one that takes the urine outside the body. Next organ we want to look at is the human brain. Uh, here we want to concentrate on the cerebrum, that is the big part of the brain, uh, which does a lot of work, but most importantly, it is our bank, or our memory. This is where we keep a lot of things, and this is we, what we use when we want to think. Uh, as, we are, as I'm communicating to you, I'm using largely that part, and you listening, you're also using that to retrieve the information and uh, keep it there. Uh, another important area I want us to look at is the yellow part, the cerebellum. Uh, it's very important because it is the one that helps to control our motor muscles. If you're walking, running, jumping, lying down, whatever, 
it plays a very important part in controlling your, mus your muscles. Um, the brain stem is made up of the pons and the medulla. Now, this play a very important part in uh, things we are not conscious of, but uh, they're very vital for us to stay alive. Uh, your heart beating, your, your lungs um, helping you to breathe, uh, you need to do some other things, you know, like um, digestion, things moving around your body and so on. All those quiet things are controlled by that area. Um, next, let us look at the hypothalamus, another very important area of the, um, the, the brain that helps you in things like, you know, desire. You're feeling hungry, you're feeling thirsty, uh, things you want and this and that. It's the one that is helping you to control those areas. And the most important for me is the pituitary gland because it's the one that controls uh, even some other parts of the brain and of course the rest of the body by means of uh, special chemicals that are called hormones. Um, it releases these hormones and these hormones in turn trigger hormones from other parts of the body and this is what controls how we grow, how we do things and uh, a lot more things. But again, uh, looking at the human brain as an organ, most important, look at the cerebrum, it controls thinking and memory. Cerebellum controls motor action. The brain stem controls unconscious things we do like breathing and so on. The pituitary controls uh, the rest of the body with hormones and so on. The hypothalamus helps us with our desires, you know, you're feeling hot, you're feeling cold, temperature and all these things. Hypothalamus, thanks to it. So, muscular organs or system, um, here we can see uh, what muscles, good muscles, actually look like. Uh, here we want you to concentrate on two muscles here. Uh, we have the biceps, you know, if you make a fist, this bump here is actually your bicep muscles. And uh, at the back, you actually have another set of muscles that we call the triceps. They work together. So if you want to lift something, the biceps will contract, they become fat and short, and uh, the others will relax. But if you want to put your hand down, then the opposite happens. The ones at the back will contract, and the ones at the front will relax. So you also need to look at the connections there. You, know? you have an area where the muscles are connected to the upper part of the body uh, by means of uh, special tough tissues that we call tendon. You may have observed this when you are eating some kind of, uh, I mean, when you're giving meat. In some instances, some meat, you know, you have something like plastic, very tough. Those are tendons. They help to connect the muscles to the bones. And of course, you need to know the bones, but when we get there, we look at them. Uh, something very important, if you look at the picture on the right, is uh, the names of the points of uh, connection for the muscles. Where the muscle is connected to the part that doesn't move a lot, like up here, we describe as the origin of the muscle. And the, the one that is connected to the part that moves a lot, that's the insertion. So next, we want to look at the reproductive system. So on the screen, you have the male reproductive system, uh, comprising of, importantly, um, we have the testes. This is like a factory that uh, makes sperm cells. And uh, on the testes, you have um, the epididymis, which is the store. You know, when you make things, you need to store them. And that is where they are stored until they... But while they are being stored, they are also, you know, like upgraded, so they become very effective. And then you have the tube that takes the sperm when you need to take them out. So you, that tube is called the vas deferens, or sometimes simply we say sperm duct. You know, in science, a duct is a tube. Now, if we go up, we follow the sperm duct or the vas deferens, you can see um, we have the prostate gland, so the tubes, you know, connect there. Uh, you also have the seminal vesicle, and then a little bit below, you have the cowper's gland. All of this produce some uh, liquids that help in providing a medium for the sperm cells to move and also to protect them. So all this mixture of the liquids and the sperm cell, we refer to them as semen, S-E-M-E-N. 
this is what is taken out when uh, a boy or a man uh, releases, and that the process is called ejaculate or ejaculation. Uh, the penis is there, is not well, sh is faintly shown, the penis, and then of course the scrotum is there enclosing the testis. And if you look at the picture on the far left, you can see the position of the male reproductive organ. Uh, we come to the female reproductive organ. Again, if you look at the far right, you can see the position of the female reproductive organ. And uh, if you go next to it, you can now see the different parts. Most important is the uterus, commonly called the womb. This is where the baby develops. And um, let's look at the sides of the uterus. You can see branches there. These are also tubes. Uh, they're called the fallopian tube. Another name for it is the oviduct. Now, at the end of the fallopian tube, you have something like funnel-shaped structures which are closely linked to the ovary. The ovary, like the testes in the male, is a factory that makes eggs. Now, when the eggs are made, they drop into the funnel there, funnel-like structure of the fallopian tube. They come to the uterus, and um, if uh, this female has not had any, you know, intercourse or copulation, it means there will not be any sperm cells, so these eggs are going to pass out through the female genital that we refer to as the vagina. So these are the female and the male reproductive organs. Again, you must know the position of each of the parts, the names of the parts, make sure you know how to spell them, and of course the function of each of the parts or you have labeled. So now we come to our lesson proper, which is the body system. Now we've revised all these things because uh, most of these topics are towards the end of the textbooks and uh, due to time constraints, um, most teachers will not be able to cover all this. So we are here with the human body systems. Okay, so uh, here we are. The, our next lesson, our actual lesson is on the body systems. Uh, we revised in grade 7 the sense organs. Hopefully you remember the eye, the ear, the nostril, the tongue, and the skin as sense organs. When we went to grade 8, we looked at some body organs or some human organs, the heart, the lungs, the reproductive system, the urinary system, organs of the urinary system. So here now we're coming to look at some systems a little bit in detail. So first one to look at is the digestive system. I take a good look at this picture so you can see the position of the organs of the digestive system. Uh, the mouth is not shown there, but you can see the tube that brings the food down to the stomach. And then you have the liver. You can see the uh, gallbladder a little bit below the liver. Of course, it's attached to it. And uh, we can see the large intestine and the small intestine. So that is the digestive system. So let's look at uh, <coughs> a label diagram here. Let's look at the left. I mean, um, the, the right of the skin, sorry. Let's look at the right of your screen. screen. At the top, we have the mouth. And uh, you can see the position of the salivary glands somewhere there and a little bit down. And of course, we know inside the mouth we have the tongue, we have the teeth. These are very important in digestion. Then the tube we're talking about is the esophagus. Um, this is the American spelling. The English or British spelling should be O-E-S-O-P-H-A-G-U-S, -E esophagus. The esophagus leading to the stomach. Now, the stomach continues to form that U-shaped or C-shape, that is the duodenum. Uh, it's not labeled there. Now, between a, something like behind and between the duodenum, you have the pancreas. Now, the small intestine continues down. If you're doing advanced biology, you'll be told three areas, you know. Uh, you have the um, jejunum, uh, you have the First of all, we've talked about the duodenum, then you come down to the jejunum, and then the ileum. But at this level, just know it as the small intestine. But the duodenum, which is just after the stomach, is very important. 
then that is connected to the large intestine. Now, where the small intestine connects to the large intestine, you have the appendix, very important uh, part of the body because uh, for now, at this level, our bodies don't use it. And in some instances, complications can occur there. It can become disease, bacteria may infect it, and it can become very painful. If it is not removed, it becomes rotten and affect the rest of the intestine. So it, operations, minor operations actually have to be done to remove it and then the patient goes away. So you have the large intestine, that is that uh, bigger structure you are seeing that is going up, goes across, comes down, goes to the back of our body, and then finally ends out as the anus. So you have the large intestine. Uh, let's look at the anus, down at the bottom. The anus, like uh, we have at the bladder, the sphincter muscles that help to control the flow of urine. So is the anus that controls the flow of feces. Now feces are stored or kept in the rectum until when it is convenient for you to release them, then you can take them out. So let's go to the uh, left of the screen where we describe digestion as the process by which large food molecules are broken down into simpler and soluble forms because these are the forms in which the body is able to take them in and then be able to use them. So digestion is brought about by biological catalysts that we call enzymes. Catalysts are things that help to make reactions go faster. But uh, we always add that they themselves don't get used up because the catalyst will come, they help in the process, and then they go back and do more help. Uh, next, digestion takes place in the alimentary canal or gut which is simply a long tube that stretches from the mouth to the anus. So if we go back to the diagram on the right of the screen, from the mouth, you can see we go to the esophagus, stomach, duodenum, small intestine, large intestine, uh, rectum, down to the anus. All of that forms the alimentary canal from the mouth to the anus. Now let's go back to our writing on the left. Uh, third point, the alimentary canal and all other organs involved in digestion make up what we call the digestive system. So we've named the parts of the alimentary canal. Uh, that is, now we look at the liver, of course with the uh, gallbladder, plus the pancreas. So all of this together, together with the alimentary canal forms the digestive system. Uh, digestion involves both physical digestion, like the chewing of the food, crushing, churning of the food. Churning is done in the stomach, where in the stomach walls, you know, mix and, uh, you know, press on the food so that enzymes will be able to reach it. And it also involves chemical digestion, which is done by the action of enzymes. I already mentioned to you that enzymes are the biological catalysts that help in the process of digestion. The mouth, what happens in the mouth? Um, salivary glands, which we mentioned to earlier, will produce saliva, the spittle that we have in the mouth. It's very important because it softens and moistens the food. Now the salivary glands, the, the saliva they produce also contains salivary amylase. This is an enzyme. It works on cooked starch which it changes to maltose. The tongue in the mouth moves the food around as you chew in so that uh, you know, it mixes the food and moves it around so that uh, the food is, you know, uh, every part of the food gets the saliva and is uh, broken down properly and so on. And at the end of your chewing, the food rolls into what we call a bolus, a small piece of food, and then that is sent down by swallowing. And the name of the process of swallowing is peristalsis. Peristalsis is simply muscles contracting and relaxing so that when those are the behind the food, when they contract, they squeeze the food and those in front will relax and that makes the food push down. This is what goes on throughout the length of the alimentary canal to help food to move down the body. And the stomach, the stomach keeps the food for any time from, you know, some few minutes up to hours, it depends on the type of food that is eaten. Uh, the stomach produces gastric juice that contains hydrochloric acid and the enzymes, namely pepsin, 
which brooks proteins and renin that coddles or coagulate milk. Food is turned into a liquid paste that we call chyme. Now the chyme is released into the duodenum of the small intestine. If we take a look at the diagram, you can see what we're describing. Okay, from the stomach, the food is sent to the duodenum, that curve that you see there. And uh, while it is there, or while the food is in the duodenum, the liver secretes bile. What's the work of bile? It is there to emulsify fat, to emulsify means to break them into smaller pieces, because if they are big pieces, it's difficult for enzymes to digest them. The gallbladder is there to store that bile. And uh, when it is necessary, that is when there is food in the duodenum, the bile is released through the bile duct. Now you can see on the right, the pancreas will also secrete pancreatic juice. And this pancreatic juice contains enzymes for all the kinds of food, which include trypsin for the proteins, amylase for the carbohydrates, and lipase for the lipids, that is the fats and oils that we eat. The small intestine produces intestinal juice or sucus entericus. It contains peptidases. These are enzyme proteins. They change peptides, which are smaller molecules of proteins, because the bigger molecules just call them proteins. The smaller molecules, we call them peptides. So peptidases will change the peptides to amino acids. These are the final molecules of the protein. Lipase will change lipids to fatty acids and glycerol. Remember, lipase works on fats and oil, which generally we call lipids. Uh, the carbohydrates, they include maltase, sucrase, lactase. Maltase changes maltose to glucose. Sucrase changes sucrose to glucose and fructose. Lactase changes lactose to glucose and galactose. Uh, you might see some similarity in the sounds here, but watch the spelling. Maltase is the enzyme, the A, ACE. Maltase is the enzyme. The O's, maltose, is the food molecule. This is made from uh, cooked starch or starch. That is carbohydrate. So maltase changes maltose to glucose. Sucrase is to sucrose. Lactase is to lactose. This should be easier for you to remember. Finally, the large intestine absorbs water and minerals and forms feces. Now, absorption is done by the villus. On the right is a diagram of the villus. It is composed of very thin you know, epithelium or cells. And inside these cells, you have the blood capillaries. You have the, uh, the capillaries from the arteries and then you also have capillaries um, joining up to form the veins. So these are there to absorb the products of proteins and carbohydrates. In the center, you have the lactyl, that um, orange diagram you see in the middle. That is the one that absorbs the products of um, fats and oil, or the lipids that are broken down to fatty acids and glycerol. So here you can see in the small intestine on the left, this is what the inside looks like. And uh, when they cut a small piece on the right, you can see the different things that look like little, little fingers. These are the villi. One is villus. So you can see blood vessels and other things that help to absorb the nutrients. I would like us to stop here. So next time, next class, we're going to start with the respiratory system. And we'll be looking at other systems, respiratory uh, we'll look at the reproductive, the skeletal, the nervous, and a host of other systems. Thank you very much for your, your time. I hope you would review your lessons. Again, remember, with this topic, in most instances, you're required to be able to label the diagrams, state the functions of the diagram, I mean, the parts that are labeled, and sometimes you'll be required to state, is this the respiratory system? Is this the reproductive system? Is this the digestive system? You must know those names. That will help you better with your exam. Uh, thank you once again. My name is Mr. Kreish. <laughs>